talking a bit about the three-tier model, which very roughly speaking means that there are children who are doing just fine, there are children who are not doing so fine but would be doing fine if they got more appropriate instruction, and then there's a third group who, even if they got more appropriate instruction, um, still wouldn't do so fine and they need something special. Now, that's a vague idea, but it's understandable, and it seems to be gaining credence in most countries, and it's got a much more specific um, embodiment in the response to intervention model. And so Kerry's going to tell us about that. Sometimes there's a lot more than one, two or three tiers. There's a valley of tiers that uh, we see from time to time, very sadly. I want to talk about something uh, that's come about in the research literature with, uh, with a vengeance, um, particularly over the last uh, five to ten years, and it's called response to intervention. It was initially introduced as a way of uh, moving beyond the method of categorising learning disabilities through a discrepancy between intelligence and attainment in whatever area was of interest. Uh, whether dyslexia involved uh, someone with average or better intelligent with uh, crappy reading or spelling or writing or maths, then uh, if they were considered uh, bright enough, then the only conceivable reason that they might have a problem with a given curriculum area must be some internal neurological glitch. Therefore, they have a learning disability. That was called the discrepancy model because it implied a discrepancy between intelligence and attainment at a, of a given skill. Uh, that's been under increasing pressure over the last 20 years as not a very fair method of discerning who should get assistance uh, of not being a very good method because the people who were diagnosed with learning disabilities and those who missed out on such a diagnosis tended to respond very similarly anyway to interventions of the same type. We haven't had such a great uh, issue with learning disability in Victoria because there is no funded category at this stage for anyone with a learning disability. But it is of significance in some states and certainly in the US where it's one of the fastest growing uh, uh, problems in education uh, across the population, almost as fast as the discovery of the uh, problems of autism, which is also uh, reaching epidemic proportions, at least in the way in which it's being diagnosed. Just as we had uh, uh, huge increases in the reporting of ADHD about 10 or 15 years ago in Australia. And I can recall one, uh, one area in Western Australia that had something like 10 times the rate of diagnosis of ADHD than uh, the average across Australia. And so some of those are reporting issues rather than real incidence issues. So I'm not going to say too much about the discrepancy model, but rather to talk about what RTI has come to mean. Its popularity has gone well beyond simple categorisation of students into a box uh, as to why they may be having a difficulty. It's become um, much more interesting to consider it as a means of precluding educational attainment problems rather than one of simple categorisation. There are some assumptions uh, behind this model called RTI. Um, the assumptions are that children can learn and that a major variable in whether they do or not is the way in which teachers teach. So learning is considered primarily uh, a function of the quality of instruction. And that's a bit of a shift over the last 30 years I mentioned uh, this morning. The way there was a prevailing opinion in the late 60s and 70s that uh, a child's background, both genetic and in, and in upbringing, really set the, up, the upper limit for what children are capable of achieving and schools could really only um, act as the guide on the side in the child reaching that uh, somewhat limited attainment level. So the expectation is now that, uh, that instruction is a major determinant of outcome. It's not to diminish the notion that there are children who come to school with significant educational and developmental differences, but rather that the potential of instruction is so powerful that to a great degree, early, intensive, uh, apt instruction can make a huge difference in the potential that these children will reach. Uh, 
<clears throat> the other aspects of intervention, I mentioned a couple of those before, that if one has, um, has exemplary instruction, that is instruction that is consistent with what's been found to be the case in both theoretical and empirical studies of a given area, so if we were talking about reading, we know now about the importance of an early emphasis on letter sound correspondences and blending and segmenting and uh, the oral language component of uh, reading development as well. Um, given that uh, an initial teaching in involves uh, careful attention to those, what other variables do we have within the educational system to assist those children who might to deal with uh, exemplary instruction. And the variables really, um, leaving aside uh, contact with the home, which is potentially very powerful, but as any teacher will tell you, among the cohort of their lowest performing students, the families from which those students come often have the fewest resources to actively make a difference in those children. So we, we really do, in the education system, have to deal with what we can deal with. What are the variables we've got to play with? So is, let's suppose we have um, an average of an hour a day on literacy activities that involve maybe 20 minutes of phonemic awareness, phonic activities um, built, uh, built alongside work on writing. We know writing and reading are very important cohabitants of literacy and uh, some time spent on spelling. And we're doing a regular assessment of our children's progress with spelling tests and uh, measures of writing adequacy and measures of reading. And we find that uh, some of our children are not learning as well as we would have hoped. Some of the variables we can then play with, the first one is intensity. Intensity simply means increasing, maintaining the same sort of program, but increasing the amount of time that the child is actively engaged in those activities. So if we are teaching, uh, say, phonics, we may find that we need to do many more practice opportunities. Practice is a term that seems to have gone out of education over the last 20 years. The notion that uh, all learning must be fun, that student engagement determines outcome, Therefore, we must have students engaged. Therefore, we mustn't make them upset by giving them practice. We must just make it all humorous and enjoyable. Somebody once said, and I think it's a very wise statement, if I can remember what it is exactly, that uh, some people say that all learning is fun. But learning is not fun. Skilled performance is fun. Learning is quite often difficult, and it's quite often painful. You know, we hope that it's not going to be painful, but we should recognise that for many children, practice opportunities sufficient to obtain mastery and then beyond that to obtain fluency are going to take time and effort. And uh, John made that point too earlier today, how important it is to recognise and not be put off by the need for practice. So we can increase the intensity with which we uh, engage a child in the given problem area. We can increase the duration. We heard that one of the problems with reading recovery was that a 12 to 20 week period for many children was simply not sufficient for those skills to become entrenched and to reach the stage of bootstrapping where children are capable of developing further by themselves. So it may be for some of our children we need to focus on uh, an expectation that the duration of our uh, intervention is going to have to be significantly longer than for other children. Group size may be an issue that uh, a skilled teacher may well be able to work with half a dozen strugglers at the same time. A less skilled teacher might uh, have difficulty with two. It may be that for some children one-on-one -on -one instruction uh, is deemed necessary. It isn't really there in the research that one-to-one -one instruction is necessary for anyone. It's purely a managerial issue. But for uh, a lot of children and for teachers who are not so good at managing groups and not sensitive to all group responses, then one-on-one -on -one is a way of ensuring both child attention and the teacher's attention to that one child is easier than paying attention to a small group. Um, student engagement. Student engagement is very important. 
but as John pointed out, it's largely a, an issue related to the student's success. If you're working with older children, say in secondary school, they may well have additional behavioural issues. They may be disheartened and not want to become engaged. In which case, <coughs> pardon me, in which case it may be necessary to introduce reinforcement systems to gain their cooperation initially. But in most uh, of the research, it becomes clear that once the students are seeing success, then it itself becomes the major motivator. And so motivation moves from extrinsic where necessary to intrinsic as long as success is being achieved. So engagement, very important, but engagement also occurs within lessons that are fast-paced, as John described, in lessons in which children are constantly responding and don't have time to get into uh, distraction or to cause uh, difficulties. Lesson pacing, as I've mentioned, is uh, part of the component of uh, engagement. So how might you uh, make use of this RTI model? Well, initially, we know that uh, initial assistance is far superior in, in effect and with ease uh, than is subsequent remedial assistance. So beginning students are going to be screened for the pre-skills necessary, and that might involve, and the research suggests for beginning students in reading, that a test of phonemic awareness combined with a test of letter name or letter sound knowledge, you put those two together, you will have a pretty good indication of what children coming into your prep grade are likely to be in need of extra assistance. So uh, it's possible to screen children even prior to uh, the introduction of your curriculum. So then all students provided with a validated program and the expectation there is Let's suppose, and I put forward pretty much um, arbitrarily, that uh, our problem rate of reading is 20%. Uh, if you look at some government uh, reports, you know, it may be considered to be 10%. If you look at some other independent reports, it might be 30%. Let me just say 20% uh, for argument's sake. The expectation is that the actual number of children with significant issues in learning is closer to 5%. That seems to be uh, internationally pretty much what you can expect to give the number of students likely to have difficulty in learning in a given grade, 5%. That means that if we've got 20% of students causing us trouble, then it may well be that by introducing exemplary instruction that we're able to bring down the proportion of children who struggle rather than 20%, we get it down somewhere below 10 and perhaps approaching 5. The student though, despite that, the student who then is presenting with significant difficulties, and we will only know that if we have established a means of regular monitoring of the skills that we are teaching. And I'm talking here regular as about a weekly or fortnightly assessment of progress in, say, reading or spelling, whatever it happens to be, with an expectation of a fairly linear line of progress that what we expect of the children at the end of our prep grade, we should be able to measure and draw a line between where they are now and where they need to be at the end of the year. And then our progress assessment tells us whether they're continuing along that line or falling below that line. If they fall below that progress line, then we look at the introduction of uh, uh, increased uh, time or uh, maybe even a specific researched intervention different to that of the uh, regular program. But most typically, it involves uh, just changing the, the program to the extent of providing it more intensively. In one of the programs we use in the clinic, there is the direction to teachers at the end of every task, repeat until firm. And it's one of the areas that we have the most problems with when we train parents to use these programs with their children. The tendency to move on before something is mastered and you're building a house of cards and you think things are going okay until the house of cards comes down. Repeat until firm may have marked differences in the amount of time 
that a given child might have to get that stage where they are actually firm. Um, I'm thinking now of uh, uh, an adult with um, an intellectual uh, disability, an IQ of 50, who wanted to learn to read. She was in her mid-30s. And we were using a program called Teach Your Child to Read in 100 Easy Lessons, a very structured synthetic phonics program written for parents. And we were using it with this adult. She was not at all perturbed by the baby-like uh, features of the program. But it took 10 sessions for her to master lesson one. And right up to lesson 10, it was taking 10 sessions for her to master a given lesson. Then from lesson 10 onwards, it was taking six goes to master a given lesson. And by the time we'd got to lesson 30, it was taking four attempts. What we were seeing here was the need for practice, the need for endurance, but the rewards that come when the person begins to see the logic behind it all and learning to learn starts to kick in as well. <clears throat> so we, we use what are called curriculum-based measures. So if we're teaching, uh, say, um, reading accuracy and fluency, then we use a curriculum-based measure like a passage. Let's su suppose we're in a year three group. We get, uh, in our case at the clinic, we use a free test called the Dibbles, D-I-B-E-L-S, freely downloadable from the web. And there are about 20 passages for grade three and... Uh, we would have the children do these passages every week or two to make sure that they are maintaining the progress that we want. Because there are norms for those tests, what you expect a grade three child to achieve at the beginning, middle and end of the year. So this is the way we, we find out whether what we are doing is effective. It's response to intervention. And we change or alter our intervention depending on the quality of that response. We take it as given that if the child isn't learning, then we're doing something wrong. Not that the child has a problem, but that we have a problem. One of the reasons why a child might not be doing well is that the uh, intervention is not being presented with fidelity by the teacher. So we would want someone, such as John Fleming, to come into the class to observe what's going on. Is the teacher modifying the program to suit their own teaching style? Are they leaving bits out? Are they racing through other parts? Are they not repeating till firm? Are they not providing enough practice? But let's assume all of those things are being met and that the program that's been selected is being faithfully um, uh, adhered to. And I should point out, the reason why a program is effective is often to do with its picky, picky details that the way the program was designed is often extremely carefully organised. It's often field tested first, even down to the extent of wording in some programs. And so if the program has got good uh, validity, has been shown to be useful, it's likely to be because the program was presented in the way it was written. If we play with the program and use bits of it here and there, we're likely to find uh, a different set of results. So if uh, fidelity is the case, but there are still pro problems, then we work on those other variables, begin to introduce them uh, as a way of um, attempting to increase the uh, performance of the student. And it's only then, <coughs> after having uh, addressed the issues of good initial instruction, paid attention to the details of fidelity of instruction, then modified instruction so that it uh, improves the uh, various other components like intensity and duration and so on, only then, if there is complete failure to respond, might a definition of learning disability become relevant. Uh, the advantages, um, it allows schools to intervene early. I mentioned earlier today that we often see children in our clinic uh, year three and four and beyond and not often before that. This is a way, however, of checking progress right from the earliest stage and making decisions right from the earliest stage rather than the assumption that this child is just struggling a bit at the moment, maybe maturation is the problem and if we just let him be 
he'll, everything will be all right. That notion simply doesn't work. The, the proposed, uh, or at least in research, the relationship between uh, slow initial progress and continued slow progress in year three and up to year six is about 0.88. That is, for every 100 children who you see struggling in the early stages, about 88 of them will still be struggling if you don't do something about it. It doesn't resolve itself. Uh, limitations of the model, it does, uh, of the old discrepancy model, was that you had to wait to fail and that's simply unacceptable in these times and unacceptable really in any time. But we now know that we can assess progress uh, continuously and hence we have an obligation to do that. Um, the discrepancy model uh, leaves out the quality of instruction as part of their formula and uh, we know that that's very powerful. And a severe discrepancy doesn't tell us what to do, nor does it tell us how the child will respond. So those are the, the major issues. Uh, it's a model response to intervention that has a lot of qualities that I believe would, uh, if adopted uh, in Australia, would make uh, far fewer children uh, face the ignominy of continuous failure in our primary school and the problems for the, their self-image, for their capacity to take risks with their learning, for their capacity to connect with a secondary curriculum. We've got the, the capacity now to do something about those things. Okay, we've got time for a couple of questions. I hope it's clear how this is a kind of very more, a more specific and more detailed um, implementation of the general idea of the three waves, which has been so popular in recent years. Questions? I guess I've got one, so, oh, yes, Nola. Thanks, Max and Kerry. Um, I'm just um, thinking, uh, would, you, would you care to comment on how long the process is? Because it would seem to me it needs to be fairly fast, otherwise we'll end up with still the young person having a lot of failure experience if they have in fact got something like dyslexia. The response to intervention model doesn't really uh, make predictions about how long an intervention might need. It simply plots the progress. And if the progress isn't what you are hoping for, then you have to make, take steps to alter the intervention in some way that is more likely to have an impact. If we are talking about a child with, say, incipient dyslexia as yet to express itself because the child is in prep and isn't really expected to decode a great deal unless you're in Belfield, in which case you, you have to be mastered it before uh, the first week. Um, if you've got a child with uh, who you think might have uh, dyslexia, then my perspective is not so much one of being troubled by the label but rather focusing on what it is that we have to do for this child and I'm greatly uh, optimistic as a consequence of the genetic studies of the studies of brain imaging and the theoretical understanding or practical understanding of the way the brain works and that the brain is capable of changing pathways of establishing new pathways and that teaching has neurological impact. We are not talking about a stable, fixed brain that might not have had an initial advantage. We're talking about a brain whose lack of advantage initially is tempered by what we do in those very early stages. And we've seen the example of uh, MRIs of brains in which the parietotemporal part, the part thought to be very important in decoding, is pretty much quiet in uh, p uh, students with dyslexia prior to strong intensive phonics intervention and the MRIs of those children subsequently shows a lot of activity beginning to occur. If you look at Shaywitz's uh, work you can see how the environment, what we do, impacts on the brain. It, it's not in the liver, it's not in the kidneys. The brain physically changes 
as a result of what we do or if we don't do, the brain goes on its own path. So um, knowing exactly how long an intervention might take is, is a data question. But knowing when to start intervention, it should be at the earliest possible moment. Okay, thanks, Kerry. I think we might move on now to the next topic, which we can probably deal with fairly briefly. Kerry will stay here. Um, we need Barry and we need Yvonne. Uh, this is about 